The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Thanks for hanging out. Midweek editions here at Tail Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency. For all your equipment financing needs, go Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, and you. Room for you today. We'll dive in on some spring football thoughts with Mike Babcock. Oscar Baseball, a dramatic win last night. So get Babber's thoughts on that in a little bit here. Mike Schuhart makes his return as we gear up for the Masters. Shuey with Wilderness Ridge this hour. And uh, next hour, we'll uh, spend time with Evan Bland from the Omaha World Herald. Have a good chat also on the way about the quarterback competition. Elijah and I'll dive into that. Numbers to dial up at 489-1240, 489-1240, 402-489-1240, or wherever you can catch us, different spots around the state, 1-800-825-5865. Stream the show. Real easy to do that on your favorite radio station app, or can watch us live with the Hale Varsity YouTube channel or Hale Varsity Twitter. Log on, follow that. And uh, and follow the Hale Varsity handle at H Varsity Radio K F O R Facebook and Twitter also allows the video stream and can interact that way. Well, we we blank it. It's already Wednesday. Good content and post practice info, along with another open practice yesterday for Nebraska. Big Red back at it tomorrow, and some thoughts on the defensive side of things tomorrow. So we look forward to that. Uh, quarterback, though, on our mind, the, the the future of quarterback and, of course, the present with Casey Thompson and Sims and Chubba Pretty and Harburg and Torres and Smothers. I mean, you can go down the list and it's going to be a fascinating race for who is uh, able to impress and develop this spring and then who really gets after it once everyone's healthy this summer and beyond. But the uh, the name that Nebraska fans continue to clamor for is Dylan Riola, not even a week removed from being in Lincoln on an unofficial visit. You know, where are things at with Riola? Really good story from on three. And Chad Simmons uh, was able to kind of run it down, and we're going to spend some time to start things off there. So what do you think, as a Nebraska fan, after last weekend, after following this pretty feverishly, Elijah, you and I are are caught up in, you know, what's going to happen with Riola. If you were a betting man right now, you got to feel good about Nebraska's chances because they're one of just two teams that have had multiple visits since January. It's been USC two times. It's been Nebraska two times. There's been one visit to Georgia. There's been one visit to Georgia Tech. That's been the the tour. Uh, You expect uh, things to continue. I mean, Penn State's going to keep chasing. Old Miss is going to keep chasing. Miami's going to keep chasing. You have quarterback tutoring that's going on in L.A., so that's in USC's backyard. And then you have the family factor. Hey, Uncle Donnie, how's spring practice going? Gee, Dylan, wonderful to hear from you again, right? I mean, I don't know the if it's a call once a week or a FaceTime or how that works, but Nebraska's unique, and USC's super unique, and again, on three's reporting with this, just to give them credit. Uh, the, the focus now, and rightfully so, for Riola is to transition to his own spring ball. That's what's so unique. Yes, you have a population base that is super advantageous because of how emphasized and, and prioritized high school football is in Texas. They have spring football in Texas. They have spring football in Florida, in Georgia, in California, in Arizona. I mean, the the, the warm weather climates, those guys can do, can can go do and do do seven on sevens all the time. Mm-hmm. Right? You're always refining your skills 
uh, although there's there's not the contact, but at least it's the, the muscle memory, right? It's it's throwing into tight windows, whether the guy's got a helmet on or not. Different, but still, it's it's working on your craft, and that's what the Riolers are are doing right now. He's at a new school, that's Pinnacle. Coach McBride's just down the street from there, so we've got our our eyes on Pinnacle High School, and. Uh, that's where the Riolas are at right now. It does not sound like right now that a return trip to Lincoln is in the offing for Riola. That means a spring game. It doesn't sound like there's a, a trip scheduled at the end of April for Oregon. Those are two changes because a week to 10 days ago, it, it, it sounded like, okay, uh, Riola may be back. This could all change. It's all fluid, but right now, he may shift just to, to working on spring football and uh, getting trained up with his quarterback uh, tutor. Uh, what's on the books right now, the official visit? June. June, Georgia. Mm-hmm. That's it right now. And uh, we'll see if there's more schools that pop up or if it's just June and Georgia and the dogs. I mean, it, it's been pretty fascinating to see this race where – it sounds like USC was in the lead. Uh, Nebraska's pulled even or, or may have an edge. Or Oregon, you can't ever count out Uncle Phil and, and Oregon and, and what they're doing up there with their own Georgia connection and, and Coach Lanning now coaching Oregon. They had a really good first season under him, uh, aside from the opening ball game. And, and, and now, you, of course, you're going to have Georgia in this. So I don't know It is what I'm going to tell you. Honestly, I have no idea what the lean is, but it still it just doesn't change the sway. The more chances you get a chance, an opportunity to be in front of of Riola, the better. And the family connections is Nebraska's not even secret weapon, but it is their advantage. My two cents on this is that Husker fans should not be overreacting to what a 17, 18 year old kid is doing with their visits simply because you don't know what's happening in the personal life. Maybe the Riola family said, Hey, you've seen all you're going to see from Nebraska. We don't need to go back for the spring game. We can watch it on TV and we can take a nice family trip and go to Hawaii and visit the grandparents. Would you rather go to Hawaii? Would you rather go to Nebraska at the end of April? It could be that for all we know. We really don't know what's going on, but my read Hawaii is always going to be there. Elijah. I mean, spring game my, happens once a year. My read is, is how many times has, dismissive. how many times has Riola been on campus to Lincoln in an unofficial capacity. He's been here for camps. He's been here for games in the fall. He's been here and seen the Matt Rule staff and gotten it. And I think it's just at a point where he goes, what is a weekend at the end of April for a spring game going to show me that I haven't already seen from Nebraska? I think this is just him kind of signaling, you know what? The era of my official visits are done. I have a top three. My read on the top three is probably USC, Georgia, and Nebraska. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get to my official visits in June. I'm probably going to have a lean by then before I go take those official visits. I'll either have what I think confirmed or I'll change my mind of those official visits. And that's whenever we'll decide. I think this is him just saying, Hey, I know who my top three are, and I don't think any more official visits, unofficial visits, I should say, are going to change my opinion of who my top three is. So if I've already seen what I need to see through this spring, why go back? That's the read I get whenever you can say, you know what? You transfer into a new school. You have new relationships you have to build. You have Got to go win that job. You have, well, well. No, it was seriously. Well. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Elijah's just like, dude, come on. I, 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 it's got to be about like building chemistry through wide receivers, going and learning a new playbook, and, and showing your high school teammates that, hey, I'm not just here for the exposure because you guys are pinnacle. I'm here to come win some games with you guys, and I'm going to show you that I'm legit and I'm coming in to be a legitimate part of this team. Go prove yourself to your guys. Yeah, as opposed to taking visits that at this point in time seem like they could be unnecessary based on what you already know about the schools. I think he has a base of knowledge with every single school he's going to. Any conversations that he has with Matt Rule don't need to be held in person with the, the modern age. You can have those at home while you're still building time and you can say, you know what? I've seen what I need to see from the University of Nebraska. The big change this time was I came and saw this facility that's now under construction. You don't need to come back and see that. You don't need to come back and see the fans of Husker Nation. You know they support you. What's the point of, of, of wasting another weekend 
at the end of April whenever you already know what you're going to see. That's my read on it. I don't think we need to overreact. Am I going to sit here and tell you that this is him saying, well, I'm all in on Nebraska. I don't need to come back. No, definitely mm-hmm. not. I don't think this guy knows where he wants to go. Um, but I think he knows who his top three is, and I think he's going to take some time, deliberate. You know what? We'll go take our visits, our official visits in June and, and see if what we think is confirmed, and that's whenever we'll make the decision. That's, that's the read I get. Well, uh, you can do FaceTime, literally, uh, if you're Matt Rule or, or some of the other head coaches. The FaceTime in person, though, is, is more of an opportunity. Uh, I think you agree that the, the more times you can get a kid to your campus, the better. Uh, the stronger relationship build that can happen, the, the better. And this may work out for Nebraska as well. Matt Rule's confident he's going to have a really good 2024 class. Mm -hmm. Is it top five or is it top 15? Is it a top 25 class? Based on the rankings, time will tell who they pull in. But let's see who they get in town for the spring game. How many were here to just check things out with Riola because they want to play with him? How many guys left last weekend saying, man, I want to come back? A lot of guys said, yeah, I want to be back. Do they do it uh, in, during the spring game? Or do you, do you let them wait a little bit and then have them come back during the fall? But that may be too late because it sounds like summertime is going to be that commitment window. He wants to make a decision before his senior season. So it doesn't look like it's going to be – uh, April or, or May for a decision, especially if there's a official visit in June for Georgia, that timeline. So is it a July thing? I don't know. Mo- more and more quarterbacks commit earlier, but he has so many options because he's the top player in the country. He is going to do his due diligence. And in terms of hypotheticals that we're talking here, again, I want to emphasize we're not in communication with the Ryla family. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes, just like really nobody in Nebraska media knows what's going on behind the scenes. So uh, a potential thing for what could be going on behind the scenes. He could talk to some guys that were here this weekend and they could say, you know what? We want Nebraska on our list of official visits. And Rell's like, well, I'll be back here for the spring game. And they go, eh, we'll come back for an official. And Rell says, well, instead of come back for the spring game, I'll line it up with you guys and come back for an official visit this summer. That mm-hmm. could be what's going on here for all we know. Could it be, this could be a great move for Nebraska for all we know. This could be a positive or it could be an absolute negative. It could be Ryla saying, I saw what I needed to saw on the official visit and I've decided Nebraska is no longer in the running. Is that a possibility? Sure, it's a possibility, but there's so much that remains to be seen in this recruitment for us to actually figure out what's going on behind the scenes. And we might not know until a commitment has been made by Dylan Ryla what exactly is going on behind the scenes. He's been to a basketball game. He's been to a baseball game. Uh, he's checked out the, the the football he's checked out the game environment nick has a good question here i'm having harrison beck flashbacks uh don't don't do that to yourself to the throw god <laughs> don't don't compare the two don't let your mind go there i drink the kool-aid every year if Riola doesn't commit do we still get a good class i think you do i think you absolutely do get a good class because of the fit and the thoroughness, does it guarantee that uh, each kid they take is going to be a three-year starter and a two-time all-conference guy? No. But I think where my mind goes is to the development phase. The, 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 the more talent they get in, the, the development's going to be consistent with Rule and his staff. How much development is, is a kid going to need? And it, that varies based on how they enter into college football. And a five-star could be somebody that, that's got all the tools you're drooling over. But guess what? When it comes to transitioning to college football, there still is some refinement they need. It's rare where you just make the jump in your Trevor Lawrence and by game six you're killing it. But let's, let's also remember here, I think we, we need to get our, our definition of what a good class is straight because in order to have a... Kids that stay and play. That's and, one way and, to put and, it. And win games. Sure, sure. That's my definition. Well, well, With, whenever I think Nebraska's of, of the definition... Kids stay and play. And maybe Nick has to, to clarify this. Whenever you say, can we have a, a good class, you think of one of those top 20 recruiting classes that's going to allow you to compete for conference championships. And the standard with your recruiting classes from the past 10 years of, of whoever's winning conference championships is you go get a, a crown jewel type quarterback in your recruiting class to bring it all together. You, you do need that crown jewel type quarterback in the a class in binder. order in order to go compete for a conference championship, a national title, a college football playoff appearance, 
whatever your your high lofty aspirations are, you do need that crown jewel quarterback. It doesn't mean that that quarterback is going to be the guy who is leading the offense once you get there. But I think in order to put together a class of, of high level guys, guys that are going to be three year starters on your football team. You need to have that quarterback just as something to, to bring it all together and give those guys another reason to commit to your school. You can sell them on the vision all you want, but the vision becomes a lot harder to sell if you say, yeah, we have all the pieces we need to win, except a quarterback in this class. Go get go get the dudes you like, whether they're three-star, five-star, no-star, two-star, whatever, and go to work with them. And I think that's going to be rules approach, whether you're a five-star or – uh, a, a portal edition. What, what I will say is I don't think you need that crown jewel type quarterback in order to get Nebraska back to where Nebraska fans want it to be. That's a that's a, a want, not a need. There's a lot of other things that need worked on in this program, things that need to be improved before that crown jewel quarterback is 100% necessary in order to go compete where Nebraska fans eventually want this team to compete. So it's not a need in order to get this class back to where it can be to improve Nebraska to a point where Husker fans are going to be happy, but it is necessary eventually with Husker football to get one of those guys in order to, to take you back into that realm of competing for a Big Ten championship. You, you can get the, 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 the next Turner Gill, Tommy Frazier, Trevor Lawrence – insert stud and if you're not worth a damn on the lines of scrimmage it ain't gonna matter Mm -hmm. because they're gonna run it down your throat in november if they're michigan and they're gonna tee off on your quarterback on third and eight because there's no gain on first and ten with the run play or maybe you're trying to throw it and guess what there's seven guys in the backfield so there, there is priorities but there is that that wow factor And to your point, yeah, you bring a class together with that stud quarterback. Makes it a little easier. Mike Babcock checks in next to Tale Varsity, presented by Currency. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. We'll keep this recruiting debate going. Good input from Nick, Elijah, and Craig. We'll get to your comments here. Mike Babcock joins us. HaleVarsity.com and Magazine. Babbers, we'll get your take, man. You've seen a lot of classes over a lot of years. That centerpiece quarterback, uh, you think you get. Some of them have turned out to be that centerpiece quarterback of a class and uh, a program changer, Turner Gill. And, uh, of course, Tommy Frazier. And then you have guys that, that can come in and contribute. They, they start a year or two, and they're, they're beyond serviceable. They're good players. What's your read and take on this whole Riola thing? Well, you know, it's because of his connections to Nebraska. I think that, that increases the drama <laughs> nice. of, of the situation yeah. for Husker fans. And, I, you know, I, I think about a, a – he was an SID at Texas. I don't remember the name, but he used to say there's two seasons at Texas, uh, football and spring football. And, and, you know, I would add one more to that now. It's football, spring football, and recruiting, mm-hmm. which, is a, which is a year-long kind of a thing. People get passionate about that. And, you know, you can say, well, this is really a good class, or it's not a good class, but – the next group, look at the next group. It's always the next group. It's always the next group coming in. And in, in, in this case, um, it kind of stops here because of the family connection, I think, with with Riola and the fact that he's considering Nebraska in a situation where Nebraska has not had a lot of success here in recent seasons. Um, that That underscores how exciting it is that a five-star quarterback would consider Nebraska and have it down to the – probably down to his last uh, three or four, you mm-hmm. said, uh, probably uh, schools. I, I think that magnifies it. But I go back to the boring thing that I always say, I guess. Um, if he were to come here, is he going to be successful based on the players around him, the players up front the offensive line, the running backs, the receivers – the tight ends, how is that going to play out? And, uh, and and so I think that when you look at recruiting, you've got to get excited about not just the quarterback, but other guys that have committed that are coming in to Nebraska. Um, and, and you had, uh, I, I think you had a four-star offensive lineman. You had a four-star running back from California, both of them from California. Mm-hmm. And you need to mesh 
And, and if you don't get Raiola, consider that you do have, you know, uh, Purdy is just, he's a sophomore. Mm-hmm. And there was excitement, you know, when he came here, uh, transferred here. Uh, Smothers, here's the thing. I, I, you know, I wonder if come end of the spring practice, if somebody's going to be in the transfer portal because of what you're looking at and because of all the, the uh, uh, discussion around uh, Dylan Royal and the potential for him to come here, are, are you going to lose one or two of those mm-hmm. quarterbacks? Mike Babcock's with us here. It's Hale Varsity Radio. And Mike, is there concern in your eyes with this Royal recruitment in terms of the fact that Nebraska may be putting all their eggs into one basket? I think that's where some of this this concern comes from from Husker fans whenever, well, Dylan cancels his unofficial visit to Nebraska for the spring game. It does feel like Nebraska's been all hands on deck for Dylan. And do you worry that, that there hasn't been a backup plan considered in case Ryla does decide he wants to go to a place like USC or, or like Georgia? Well, Elijah, I think that, that some of the belief that, that it's all focused on him is the fan fan mm-hmm. passion. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think that the, it, it's difficult. It kind of gets distorted. It's difficult to really understand uh, how they're going about their recruiting because we don't know all the factors in Recruiting, We don't know all the players that they're taking a look at. Um, we've got a pretty good idea, obviously, because there's so much passion in recruiting coverage here in Nebraska as well. But, uh, I, you know, I don't think that if Nebraska doesn't get Dylan Raiola, I don't think it's automatically not a good recruiting session because, again, you've got to get the guys that can get the job done around that quarterback, whoever that quarterback is, and – Right now, in the immediate future, you've got several court. You've got Casey Thompson, you've got Jeff Sims, you've got Chubba Purdy, Heinrich Harburg, who's seeing some. They take a look at him as possibly a tight end, which you know I could understand given his size and athleticism and and so forth. And um, don't forget his name as well, Harburg. That's a tight end name. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, and it, it could be where Heinrich ends up. You know, I don't. I don't see him in the transfer portal. I see him being in a position where maybe he's going to move to a different position. Uh, but there's always that ability as a quarterback. You know, you've got that. Torres, um, you've got options there. Um, and then you can look, if you don't get Riola in this recruiting class, there's always the next recruiting class. You're always looking ahead. They're always recruiting ahead. So um, I don't think it – I don't think it totally hinges on him. It would be great if Nebraska got him, not only because of his ability, but because of the the uh, uh, the attention that he's drawn nationally. You know, the five star, the best uh, quarterback recruit out there, uh, the top recruit, whatever. If Nebraska gets him, that shows that Nebraska. Hey, um, even though Nebraska's had these losing seasons. Um, it's still it's still got the tradition and and it's still got the ability to bring in a quarterback like that. But I don't I really don't think that Nebraska is putting all of its it's all in on one guy. I think that that recruiting class is going to be reflective of um, Nebraska's needs, um, what guys fit into the system that they're trying to build here, and you know, in in some cases guys that uh, maybe will come in and redshirt one year to develop. Mike Babcock with us from HaleVarsity.com and Magazine at MD Babs on Twitter. Get the digital and print subscription today. Uh, HaleVarsity.com backslash offer is how you can get signed up and get those Husker needs met uh, in the mail and online. So I, I, I love the take with they're not going to shut the program down if they don't get Dylan Riola. Uh, <laughs> there, there are quarterback options that are on campus. I'm anxious to see that development. Let's stay there, Mike, and get your take here on on some observations you had from uh, Jeff Sims yesterday. We know Casey Thompson's super limited, but there are a, a number of guys that can use this spring to to develop and hone, and it, it sounds like they're all getting a chance to develop and, and get some time, and it sounds like those reps have been pretty evenly split per Satterfield. Uh, Sims was impressive yesterday. 
Yeah, and I thought he's very articulate. I thought he said some nice things about uh, uh, Casey Thompson. Um, I think it's going to be an interesting competition come fall camp when Casey's able to go too. And again, you throw in the other guys that we've talked about, Purdy and and uh, Torres, and you know, it's Smothers. Um, assuming that uh, again that nobody yeah. goes into the transfer portal after spring practice. Um, but I, you know, I th- I think that's again that's where all the attention is. You know, you want to look at the quarterback. That's the thing, um, and and really the the determine, determination of whether you're going to be successful or not uh, comes in uh, lots of other areas. You know, again, offensive line, running backs, receivers, tight ends, whatever, and then we're even going to have a a fullback apparently, or, you know, I, I would guess that's probably going to be kind of a tight end mm-hmm. um, H back or whatever you, whatever you call that. But um, it, it, it's, it's an interesting spring, not just because of the quarterbacks. Let, let me put it that way, but I was impressed with how articulate uh, uh, Sims was and how comfortable he seemed uh, already in the, in the context of, of, uh, the team and and his expectations mike whenever you, you listen to the coaching staff how much of an idea of of what this quarterback is going to be doing in the offense come uh fall do you think we're going to be able to learn from this spring game that's going to be our our best chance to get eyes on what this offense actually looks like and it's been pretty common in college football over the past couple of years maybe decade that you don't show very much in the spring game but year one with a new coach is a different idea so I, I want to get your thoughts on just how much we're going to see from the guys like Sims and Purdy uh, as well as, as Smothers in terms of what this offense is actually going to look like in 2023 I get the sense that they're going to really uh, rotate those guys in and get those guys in there and get everybody equal kind of equal opportunity there and and uh, I because like you said the spring games are all televised now, so you don't want to show too much. Um, but we haven't seen anything of this system. So I think from that standpoint, it's going to be interesting to see something, regardless of who's playing where, um, how how this system looks different than what we've seen in the, in the, in the past. And, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Rule said yesterday was that, you know, there's going to be no, uh, uh, really no depth chart until the end of spring practice. He's not, you know, they're not looking at that. I like the fact that he's, you know, uh, zero through nine. You know, you've got to you've got to earn up the toughest guys, get those numbers. The only thing, I didn't ask the question, but I don't think an interior offensive lineman can't have a single-digit number, can he? Or can no, he? I, I'd, I'd be very surprised. Uh, I think yeah. defensive so line can get away with it. They guys on the team, but they wouldn't have that number. Right? It's uh, it's impossible as an offensive lineman because you have this series of ineligible numbers. You can't be wearing an eligible number. Yeah. So. Mike, yeah, real, which, qu- real a silly antiquated rule. Just to kind of put that out there. But. <laughs> yeah, says, so Teddy Prasca is not going to have number nine. <laughs> no, he, he could though. Uh, just put two nines there. Well, imagine an, an offensive lineman wearing number zero. I mean, come on. Yeah. A big old donut, Elijah. You guys will be <laughs> yeah, no, fired, fired Actually, up. whenever you think about it, the big guys wearing the single digit numbers never quite looks it's right. Not a good look. Well, that's where you start counting. See, zero is center. Um, one and two are guards. Uh-huh. Uh, three, three and four, four tackles. tackles. See, it just it works out that way. Mike, real quick, about sixty seconds. Uh, pretty uh, impressive win last night for Nebraska uh, with uh, with Matthews in the three run shot. You had uh, Walsh doing work on the hill. Yeah, I, I think the uh, Matthews has kind of shown that he's 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 able to step up and do things like that. I, I think the uh, the big positive out of that was. Uh, you finally had a guy, uh, Walsh, that, that gave you some innings and could be in a position where he could be that uh, third starter in your rotation, which is what they're trying to figure out, I think. And uh, uh, also, they brought in uh, Shannon again, so obviously uh, they're, they're developing him into the – I think he's going to be the closer moving forward. But uh, that's the thing is the pitching I thought was impressive. Mike, this was a lot of fun to chat some ball. We'll holler next week, and thanks for making time with us today, bud. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. There he is, Mike Babcock, historian, author, Hall of Famer, exclusively with 
Hale Varsity at MD Babs. Good to hear from him. Talk some Masters, and I'm sure Shuey's got a recruiting take on quarterback. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. We'll keep chatting some recruiting in Riola. Again, that on three story down to four. It's kind of the same three with Oregon in the mix. Nebraska, SC, Oregon. Oh, yeah, Georgia. <laughs> oh, yeah, Georgia. So uh, good stuff for Mike Babcock. We say hi to Mike Shuhart, Wilderness Ridge Golf. Shuey, we're, we're just around the corner from the Masters, man. How we doing? Doing awesome. Getting excited. Masters time means golf time. Yes, it does. Warm weather, warmer weather tomorrow. You're going to be busy tomorrow and probably Sunday. If I sneak, if I sneak on the course, do not send the henchman. Just ask me to leave. Um, <laughs> he didn't think, he didn't think that was he didn't think that was funny. Uh, <laughs> intruder, uh, Shuey, I want to get your take, man. You love Husker football. You got to read on this this Riola thing. Uh, does it say something to you that he's not coming back for the spring game? At least that's what what on three is reporting. Yeah, I don't know. That's a tough one, man. It's like all signs say that he's, well, I don't want to say all signs. It's like you sure think he would be coming. Mm -hmm. Maybe he doesn't need to come back. He's already seen all he needs to see. He's already made his mind up. And now he's just going to go experience, take his other trips, just kind of see what's out there. I don't know, man. That's a tough one to read. You know, it's like, I don't know, if it was me, why wouldn't you come here? I mean, it's like, it's a perfect situation to be a hero, all that stuff. I don't well, know. well, Mike, I don't if you want the reason why you wouldn't want to be looking here, I think you'd have to point to the record over the past five years, and you'd say, well, there's your reason for concern. Yeah, no question. But at the same time, it's like, what are they building? What do they have? Who's coming with him? All those things like that. And it's like... You would sure think in your time that you're here, you're going to turn that around and be on, you know, on the top instead of at the bottom, mm-hmm. you know. So it's like, I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's a tough one. It'd be a great get, you know, just because of his talent, first mm-hmm. of all, but all the other pieces that fall into place that he would be uh, helpful with. Chewy, if if Dylan Raiola's decisions reading a a, a green for a putt. What's the most difficult green to putt on? Oh, man, you're going to see that next week. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> pick one in Augusta is what you're telling me. <laughs> yeah, you can pick about any one, man. There's not an easy one there. I mean, they are so difficult. So, I mean, uh, the third hole, the 17th hole is probably incredibly difficult because it's so it's so small and so severe that there's only a certain part of the green that you can actually be on to even have a legitimate, a, a legitimate putt, aggressive putt. You have to putt so defensive there all the time <laughs> and you get too aggressive and the ball's going to run away from you so far. And it's like, it just, it, it, it's scary. Mike Schuart's with us, Wilderness Ridge Golf, Hale Varsity Radio. Shuey, uh, do you think the, the live folks and the PGA folks will play nice next week together? Oh, yeah. I don't think they'll be. I mean, the media will make more of it than the players will. Okay. You know, you have a few players that just will throw some barbs at some, but not much. That's too. It's too big of a tournament for them to get – caught up in all of that stuff. They'll be focused on what it is they need to do to get ready to try to win that tournament. I mean, that's that's one of the majors, and that's the first major, man. But he will be dialed in, focused on, you know, doing their job, you know, to try to win the tournament. So I don't – I think the media will blow it up way more than any of the players will. Well, that, that's been the story of, of Live Golf Shoey is that the media has been blowing up more than the players have, and they've been making stories. But now we're a little over a year into the Live Golf e- experiment, and, well, it seems to be failing. It seems like the media and, and some of the players that decided to stick around were right all along. So I want to get your reaction to that, <laughs> the, the potential for some of these Live guys to say, you know what, I was wrong. I want to get back on the PGA Tour. Uh, I, I thought that the whole time, you know. It's like, Especially, I mean, some you'll never go because some are just there for the money, you know, because it's their retirement. 
tension, basically, because they're never going to be that relative on the PGA Tour. They've been there, you know, but there are some guys over there that are that could be relative over here, you know, in, in doing what it is that, that you want to do, which is to win majors, to win championships. You know, no championship on the Live Tour is ever going to, you know, bring the same prestige as any PGA Tour event, you know. So you got – you have a – I think you have a few of those guys that will want to come back because it's like, you know, money's not everything. It's like, geez, how much money can you have? Uh, obviously, you can't have too much, but, you know, at that level, with the amount of money that they're making, I mean, titles are are equally as important as as the money to some of the players. There are some guys that it just that doesn't really matter, money. Because mm-hmm. they're, they're never going to compete. That's why they went there in the first place. Get me paid and let me do what I love doing. And if I win something, that's just uh, uh, a byproduct. Uh, but it's not a it's not a drive, and that's 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 some people's mindset. Shuey, a, a thought with uh, Mike Trout and Tiger Woods teaming up for a golf course in Jersey. What uh, what pro athlete would you team up with to design a course? Oh man, well he'd be the first one, okay. no question. Uh, uh, then you got to go with, you got to go with Aaron Judge, don't you? <laughs> That'd be all right, Judgey. That'd be, all, That'd be good. Go, the Bronx Bombers put a golf course in New York somewhere. Man, that would be home run there. Well, you're, you're not going to design a course with Aaron Rodgers. You can put an ayahuasca den at the turn. Uh, <laughs> there's so many potential options for a, an, an Aaron Rodgers golf course. <laughs> Yeah, you have to make when you make the turn. You got to go into that dark place for a while. <laughs> place, go to ten feet. A thirty-minute <laughs> darkness retreat on the turn if you shot over par. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh huh. You want to talk about glow golf? Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> it would be. Oh, the ball's talking to me. Sweet. It <laughs> says, "Hit me, hit me straight, please. Hit me far and hit me straight." Shuey, before we go, partner, what's happening at Wilderness? Spring is here. You got the Aquatic Center that's incredible. All sorts of things going on with restaurants and uh, choices and membership opportunities. Man, give folks uh, the rundown here for this spring. We got uh, construction going on our new tennis pickleball complex. So uh, that's that's getting closer and closer each day. So another amenity that we're adding. So the Timbers members area opened up. It's beautiful down there. As the weather gets nicer, we're getting closer to the swim-up bar being open for Schmidt to enjoy or two. So <laughs> people are just really anxious, man. They're waiting for some nice weather. They want to get out there and play golf. So starting to green up. It's getting exciting. It's getting are, exciting. Are you planning on bringing Matt Rule out to, to get those uh, pickleball courts open in the right way? He's got an open invitation to come out anytime you want. Heard it right here. All right. Shuey's laying it down. Uh, Shuey will purposely lose to him in ping pong and then get <laughs> even on the golf course with him. Mike Shuart, Wilderness Ridge. Shuey, real quick partner. Uh, folks can log on and find out more where for membership info. Go to wildernessridgegolf.com. Any and all information you need uh, is right there. Look for Tammy Nagel is her name. She's our membership chair. So contact her and she can give you all the information you need on on what we have to offer. And, and uh, you can set up a tour. You can come out and take a tour and see what's out. That's awesome. Sure, we will talk next week, bud. Thanks for the time. You bet. Thanks for having me. Stay safe. And now. And now. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. One final time this hour, Evan Bland, about 10 minutes away. We'll check in with Evan, some Husker football and baseball. Some thoughts on the quarterback battle. Who you betting on? Is it Sims and that's it? Or do you think someone else can make some headway this spring? Those lasting impressions. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Hale Varsity Radio were presented by Currency. For all your equipment financing needs, go Currency. And get buckled up, hands on the wheel, eyes and mind straight ahead. The driver has one job. That's to drive a message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. So Craig chimed in. We started the show talking about Riola, the on on three story about where things stand. And it doesn't sound like a return trip to Lincoln or a trip to Oregon in the offing in April for Riola. 
Uh, again, that is from Chad Simmons of On3, their national reporter. Listen, um, there are uh, four teams in contention, USC, Nebraska, Georgia, and Oregon. And uh, you've got uh, good buzz with USC. You have Lincoln Riley, his history of quarterback development. You've got Murray and Baker and uh, right now Caleb Williams. That's the uh, the pitch for, for SC. Right now the deep ties to Nebraska. Uh, you have the the love that's been very real by Rule and Company as the top target, and uh, of course uh, Donnie is a member of the staff. You want that ultimate centerpiece for your first class in your first season. Now Riola did a, I should say, sorry, Rule did a great job of bringing a class together on top of the transfer portal for Nebraska to close like they did, and we were talking about what you need versus what you want. And, and you need a really talented quarterback. We'll get into what that looks like on the field performance-wise. What's optimal for Nebraska? What, what, what's difference-making versus just steady? What, what's going what's gonna to not lose you games versus go give you the opportunity to separate yourself? Usually it's quarterback. It's a quarterback with the talent, as Mike Babcock aptly put, around him. Nebraska's got a show this season, and they're working on it now, that they can put some some guys, some difference makers, some winners around whoever the guy that's on campus is behind center and the next guy to come in, uh, ballyhooed or not, to come in and and, kind of raise the level of the program that's 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 where it is georgia uh i think they have stayed in this but i think maybe they are maybe a little bit in better in better standing than than maybe we thought and and i think it really comes down to bobo and uh and stafford and and really that there is a trust with dad's old quarterback stanford and that Georgia program, and being first. But, being first to offer, being first to recruit, that's always special. But again, we're just reading tea leaves here because I wouldn't be surprised, and I'm not saying this is happening, but I'm saying like th- my surprise level will be very little if Dylan goes and schedules an official visit for Nebraska the next weekend after he goes to Georgia, and that would completely change the complexion of Georgia. Again, it comes back to this topic of just like, he's keeping his cards close to his, his, his best here, and could Georgia be the number one school right now? Potentially. Could USC be the number one school? Potentially. Could Nebraska be the number one school? Yeah, it's all potential. I'll just say, I think as soon as he knows, I think we will know as well. Right. And and, and SC's got Malachi, their, their five-star that is supposed to be the heir apparent to Caleb Williams. Hour two on the way with Hale Varsity. The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Thanks for hanging out. Hour two at Tail Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Co Currency, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. You can find us on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio at Herbal Essence for Elijah Herbal. And uh, as always, find the show. Follow it on Twitter at HVarsity Radio. Catch us in the afternoon. Coffee and cream, Damon Benning, Andrew Rogers, 7 to 10. Uh, also with Hale Varsity Radio. We welcome in with the Omaha World Herald to talk some spring football and Husker baseball. Evan Bland joins us at Evan Bland OWH on Twitter. Evan, how's your Wednesday? Thanks for the time. Yeah, guys, doing well. Just, uh, you know, looking for some warmer weather and <laughs> practices, staying busy. You are. I'm off to baseball here in about an hour. We've got. Uh, uh, some some baseball I got to go check out for Junior. We'll see if he's thought out or not. But a lot of talk going on uh, in the recruiting world, uh, also the the quarterback competition, and a lot to glean yesterday from Coach Rule and, and a number of the players. And Evan, I want to start, and we started today off talking about uh, Dylan Riola and and the the fact he may not take some uh, some visits here 
to Nebraska here for the spring game and, and some other spots. He's going to focus on on spring football. And where are you at with um, with with his? How and the word is not necessary, but how how things go if he doesn't end up in Lincoln? Let's let's fast forward to whenever a decision happens here. How vital is he to this class? Is it is it a luxury? Yes. Is he uber talented? Yes. He could be a program changer. But do you think Rule and Company have contingency? I guess is the best way to put it. If things go a different way, yeah, I think so. I, you know, I've viewed the Dylan Rayola recruitment for a while as sort of a, you know, you have you have a lot to gain, obviously, if you land that commitment. But if you don't, um, I don't know that you lose all that much. I mean, the perception nationally would be that you know he would naturally go to a Georgia or a USC for all the obvious reasons anyway. The fact that Nebraska is even in the running, uh, I think, still is 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 probably surprising to the casual observers that are out there. Um, and you know, I don't think that there's uh, necessarily a, a requirement that Nebraska take a quarterback in the twenty four class. I mean, uh, you still have a full room at this time with that. Um, you know, Jeff Sims has a couple of years to go. Uh, should he decide to stay? Obviously, there are a number of, of younger players on that roster, too. Richard Torres is just a redshirt freshman. Chubba Purdy has three more years of eligibility, too, depending on how things all shake out. So it's not like you're desperate for bodies uh, or anything like that. So, you know, should should Dylan Rayola choose somewhere else? Nebraska still has a lot of options. I mean, they can go back to the portal. That's proven to be a place where you can find a quarterback uh, pretty consistently every year. Obviously, you can um, continue to invest in the 25 class and beyond. They had a, a talented quarterback by the name of Stone Saunders who came in uh, and visited here recently. So you still have a lot of, of options. And again, like, would it be disappointing if he doesn't come to Nebraska? Yes, but Matt Rule has found success with teams, um, you know, with quarterbacks who were less talented than Dylan Raiola and, and won a lot of games and, and was able to build a program, um, you know, in a lot of different ways. So I, I continue to view the recruitment as a high upside, kind of small downside sort of situation. And if they don't land Raiola, I think there are a lot of uh, w- different ways that they can go at that position. Even if, if – Matt Rule say does land a commitment from Dylan Ryle this summer. How much do you think it changes? It will change. Excuse me. His plans for the rebuild of Nebraska. He says he doesn't want to wait to win. He wants to win now, and obviously that would fall in line with that. But in terms of building this roster up, how much do you think that that having Dylan Ryle on the roster would just change that as a whole? Well, it certainly would generate a lot of excitement. I think there's something to be said for especially a program like Nebraska's where you're looking to to kind of take that next step and ascend as a program. There's something to be said about that first big national guy coming aboard, right? Like that sort of paves the way for a lot of other, you know, four-star, highly regarded prospects to, to sort of open their eyes a little bit because, you know, if a guy has the options that Raiola has and he comes to Nebraska, suddenly uh, every other top recruit out there is, is at least – taking pause and saying, well, you know, that's a little bit different than, um, you know, another talented quarterback going to USC or Georgia or whatever. So, like, why did he do that? And, you know, you kind of add to that just, just sort of the organic relationships that Royal has made on his visits to Nebraska, obviously being in town last weekend. And I was at the baseball game and was able to see him down there milling around with a lot of other top regional recruits at other positions and that's the kind of thing that if a guy like Raella pulls the trigger all those guys that have been able to make connections with him and I'm, I'm sure they've been communicating and, and everything since then suddenly that uh it generates a little bit of an excitement and and especially at a position at quarterback where um somebody like that can elevate the game of a lot of different people you know a lineman wants to block for a five-star quarterback of, of that ilk, um, you know, a receiver, a running back, they want to play in a system with a guy like that. So I think it just sort of uh, opens the door and, and, and um, it makes it almost feel like a safe spot for these other guys to consider where as maybe if, if nobody has jumped aboard right now in the 24 class, it would feel like a little bit more of a stretch. Evan Bland with us here, Hale Varsity Radio. Evan with the World Herald. Uh, find him on Twitter at Evan Bland, O-W-H. 
Evan, uh, when we talk about some of the position battles that are ongoing with Nebraska, what's your read on the running back room? How much versatility do you think is in that room? And talk to me about some of the options. I know we're, we're early on. There's contact that's ongoing. Um, what what do you foresee with Ramir Johnson? We were talking yesterday, and I thought, you know, for sure, maybe a third down back option. But he's also good enough to be an every down guy. I mean, Ramir's really kind of a staple of persever- perseverance. Yeah, he's a good story. Uh, you know, good good uh, redemption story, it, it sure looks like. I mean, you heard Matt Rule talking about Ramir yesterday, and yeah, he kind of skipped over 2022, which, um, you know, there was a healthy Ramir, and he just wasn't on the field for a number of different reasons, really none related to him or his own performance. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we, we saw flashes of what he could do in 21. I always think of the catch he had against Michigan that really just you know lit Memorial Stadium on fire and, and showed what he could do. Um, he's probably the straight line burner of the group. We, I think we've heard Gabe Irvin's name every time Matt Rule speaks. I mean, he's somebody who's been uh, you know really impressive to him. Uh, obviously, Anthony Grant has been back at practice now, got some, some academics and such sorted out, and so he's been back out there and uh, he was productive last year, I think, right around 900 rushing yards. And so, you know, when you hear Matt Rule yesterday say, I don't know about the rest of the Big Ten, but I like what we have in our running back room, I guess that didn't really shock me because you think back to how they constructed this roster in the off season and where they tried to address needs in the portal. One of them was not running back. I don't think they they had really any interest um, in, in contacting running backs that run the portal because they felt good about what they had. A.J. Allen uh, would be that other one who is coming off of an injury and who just looks like he oozes potential when he's been out there. So I think they recognized from film uh, back then that they had a pretty good room, and I think that's only been reinforced here a third of the way through spring. And, and I think the other part about that room is they all bring a little bit of a different skill set. I mean, Ramir Johnson's sort of that he can, he can catch the passes. He's the straight-line burner. Uh, you know, Gabe Irvin uh, is coming, comes from a big high school program. Obviously, he was uh, highly regarded when he was a true freshman um, and, and getting the starts at Nebraska the way he did. And uh, Grant sort of more between the tackles, as, as we've seen, getting north-south and, and maybe getting some tougher yards. So they have a, a wide variety, I think, of skill sets and even some body types that should serve them well here moving forward. Evan, whenever you look at this offense next year, as a whole, which race do you think is going to be more important? Is it going to be that running back race or the quarterback race? Because Matt Rule has talked about, I mean, a lot about how much he wants this offense to be, I don't want to call it run focused, but but uh, going to have a strong run game. You want 75 rushing yards per quarter. And whenever you hear that, you think, well, that running back race is going to be pretty important if that's how much you want to be running the ball. But Again, the, the quarterback is always kind of the be-all, end-all of an offense. So I want to get your take on, as we go through spring and get into summer, which of those two races for the starting job is going to be more important? Uh, I mean, I still think it's the quarterback. I mean, the running back, there's just depth there, and you're going to need many of those guys. It's unlikely, in my opinion, that one of those guys becomes sort of a feature back and everybody else fades into the background. I mean, I think that's going to be a committee. Obviously, injuries will crop up, so I think it's just as valuable to have quality depth there as it is to have you know, necessarily one guy at the top. The quarterback spot is interesting to me because, you know, again, Sims is a guy that this staff identified that they – uh, you know, Matt Rules talked about it, how he, as an NFL coach, would watch Georgia Tech games on Saturday because he used to coach Jeff Collins, who was the head coach there. Um, and so he'd watch Sims and what he could do and saw a dynamic player. And, and so it was a natural uh, natural connection when those two uh, got together in the portal and he came to Nebraska. The, the Casey Thompson part of it, I think, is a lot more interesting as this staff has gotten to know Thompson um, you know, I think you can you can notice that their answers about what Casey Thompson is all about have gotten longer. I mean, they've they've impressed. I'm sorry, they've been impressed by his work ethic. You know, Matt Rule calls him uh, like a coach off the field right now, and I think it's notable too that even um, when Jeff Sims spoke yesterday with with reporters, you know, he. <laughs> He goes out of his way to say how helpful Casey Thompson has been and and uh, what a team player he's been. So to me, that sounds like a guy uh, who's 
who's respecting the, the, the incumbent starter who's been here. Obviously, he's working uh, to be that guy himself, but I, I still think that's a race that remains undecided. And because of Casey Thompson's injury, I'm not sure you can necessarily settle anything uh, until you get well into fall camp, whereas I think with the running back um, room, at least through the end of spring, you'll probably have a pretty good idea of what you have. Evan, a thought with the Satterfield offense and how much quarterback run do you anticipate? I mean, that's Sims is going to give you that with his numbers from Georgia Tech. Casey's an athlete. He was good in the red zone uh, when called upon, and they're going to be pro style. Well, they'll be under center, <laughs> but yet we've seen some footage of Harbor going uh, short side option and, and getting to the end zone. <laughs> so, what, how is it going to be a, a staple or a sprinkle? Uh, would you imagine with Satterfield? It's a great question because they have described it as pro style, and you don't necessarily think of uh, you know the quarterback run game being heavily involved in that style. You think of that more maybe with spread attacks like we've seen at Nebraska over the years. And so, uh, you know, I, I think you, you probably want to have a, maybe a couple, a handful of design runs for your quarterback, but not too many. I mean, you look around at the top programs in college football, and they're protecting their guys. And as, as you see, if you put – your quarterback in harm's way too much, uh, injuries are going to pop up. And, and we've seen that year in and year out, uh, whether that was Adrian Martinez or Tommy Armstrong or Taylor Martinez, like that's just the nature of the thing. So I think you you want to have a guy who can pick up 10 yards on a scramble if you need to. And, you know, I, in my opinion, both of those guys can do it. I mean, Sims has been uh, somebody who's done it more in his career. But you look at Casey's time at Texas – they asked him to stay in the pocket, and he was a guy in high school uh, for a time who he was a running back. So he had some speed. He has the ability to do it. I just don't think he's been asked to do it so much. Um, so, you know, I think they're similarly skilled in that way. And then again, um, what makes it so such an interesting race is that, um, you know, Casey has his physical limitations right now, but he makes up for it with a work ethic that, you know, by all accounts is second to none. Uh, whereas Sims is sort of that hand-picked guy. So what does it ultimately look like? You know, maybe the best comp I've heard was kind of how the Philadelphia Eagles do it with Jalen Hurts, where you're still sort of a pro style, but you have a quarterback that you really have to pay attention to a little more. So that probably would be um, you know, at least a loose comparison and something Nebraska maybe could uh, would, would be happy if it turned out that way. And yeah, whenever I think of those those NFL teams that, that use the quarterback run in a quote-unquote pro style, it's the Eagles, the Bills... Uh, the the Ravens, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, there's plenty of uh, NFL offenses out there like that. Whenever I think of that, I think somewhere in that realm of four to six design quarterback runs a game. And if it's working, you use it more than that. But four to six seems to be the baseline. I think so I, for for the injury reasons that we said. But then, you know, if you're doing it more than that, then you start to you're starting to look like what Nebraska was a couple of years ago. And, and the teams that are running their quarterbacks 10 to 12 to 14 times a game, those are the guys who are, those are the teams who don't have other answers. And how many times did we see that with Nebraska where they couldn't get the run game going, whether that was line blocking, whether that was the running back. And so it was pretty much left up to Adrian Martinez to make something happen with his legs. So you don't want to go down that road. Uh, which is why I think that running back depth is important. Why bringing the offensive line along is important um, but, yeah, I think ideally you, you want to still have that element with the quarterback run where you're making the defense on the other side. Uh, you, keep, you keep that in the back of their minds, and I think that makes the offensive more effective overall. Evan, we're up against a hard break. I need 90 seconds from you on the other side to hit on Husker baseball. Can we do that? You got it. All right, good, uh, good to get caught up with Evan Bland, Omaha World Herald. What his take on Walsh and uh, what that could mean for Nebraska – with a Sunday starter moving forward. We'll dive into the quarterback options for Nebraska. And uh, the simple question here, what do you think Nebraska has at quarterback? What do you think they need uh, with that stable of quarterbacks? Evan Bland uh, continues with us here on Hale Varsity. And now. And now. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. 
Back with you, Tail Varsity, presented by Currency. Real quick, Evan Bland sticks with us here from the Omaha World. Harold, Evan, a nice win, needed win for Nebraska baseball last night, 4-1. to one. Bryce Matthews, the Superman cape and the flex with a three-run shot to, to break a tie. But the uh, bigger story was, was, um, was, was, uh, was Walsh. And, and his performance on the Hill. What, what did last night show you? Is it uh, a statement to, to Bolton Company for, for Sunday consideration? Well, yeah, I think so. <clears throat> I mean, he goes seven, strikes out, I think it was 11, and gives them uh, the kind of midweek performance that they absolutely have been looking for. And, and yes, I mean, what's interesting about the timing of it is they play a doubleheader in in Texas and in Abilene this weekend. Uh, so there is no Sunday game at all. So if they want to insert him as that Sunday guy, uh, it sets up really well for him to have that finale at Michigan when they get back into Big Ten play, you know, a week from now. So, um it's quite the story with Will Walsh. I mean, he was a guy who had two career innings to his name before he came in at Creighton a week ago and retires the first 15 he faces, and then he follows up with that, uh, you know, against North Dakota State last night. So there's no doubt that he's earned that chance. Um, he's an interesting guy. I mean, he, he was somebody who uh, was hurt most of his first two years on campus. He redshirted. He just hadn't been out there, and then he broke out, I believe it was in the Mink League last summer, as a two-way player. But, you know, even into the fall and, and into this spring, they still, I think, leaned toward considering him as a, as a position player. He's played some first and some uh, some DH, I believe, too. So uh, he's, he's really turned some heads as a pitcher, and it's been a tough go for Nebraska. I mean, they have there's a fifth-year guy they brought in who hasn't been able to uh, knock that or hold that spot down. Uh, a guy who was the Sunday starter last year for them hasn't been able to hold that spot down. A couple of touted uh, former high school prospects haven't been able to hold that spot down. So maybe uh, ultimately it's going to come down to a, a two-way guy uh, who's known more for his power bat than anything else who ends up taking this job and running with it. And if that's the case... And that's a major development for Nebraska and, and what it's looking to do here moving forward. Quickly, Evan, last thought before we get you out, one more on Husker baseball. How important do you think it it is for Nebraska to be able to find that third weekend guy? We've talked about it a lot, but whenever you look at what the bats are doing, particularly guys like Max Anderson and Bryce Matthews, it, it can't be long before those guys head off and go play professional baseball with Max Anderson batting over 400 on the year, Bryce Matthews uh, close to that same number. You got to think that the, the pro attention is going to be coming, and Nebraska needs to capitalize on that now before they before they leave and head off to go play pro baseball, right? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, you have a great offense. Uh, that doesn't mean you want to be winning every game twelve to ten. I mean, you can <laughs> uh, you can be a pretty good team if you have some pitching depth, given the the depth of this offense and what it's been able to do. And a lot's been made of of their struggles on Sunday, but essentially, what it boils down to is. When Emmett Olson or Jace Kaminska start for Nebraska, they, they've won 10 out of 12 games and can hang with anybody. When it's anybody else, they're a sub-500 team that has, has struggled to generate much momentum. So if you can have a guy that can give you some length the way that Walsh has in his last two outings, it makes a huge difference. I mean, even last weekend, they win the series against Illinois. Olson and Kaminska are both less than 100% uh, in various, for various reasons. Uh, they still find a way to, to win and to set up the bullpen, and it doesn't work out for them on, on a Sunday. So, yeah, I mean, you, you combine what this offense is and the, and the two aces that they already have, uh, and it sets up for you know quite the run if Walsh can settle in and be that Sunday stopper. Evan, awesome stuff. We'll get caught up again, and, and thanks for a few minutes today, man. Yeah, thanks, guys. All right, good stuff from Evan Bland to wrap up here with a little Husker baseball. We talked Riola, we talked quarterback, and let's dive in, Elijah. Quick, quickly, it. before we dive into the quarterback race, because I know we're going to go there, I would just like to say, and I don't want to be too dramatic with this, but based on that, that last question with Evan, I don't think it's crazy to say this offense is good enough to host a regional, and if you can get a third pitcher going in that staff, you're at a point where I think you can go win a regular season Big Ten crown if you can find that third guy. That's how good this offense is, especially about two through six in the lineup. You're phenomenal through there. The quality of like those teams that go host a regional, can the pitching catch up? I don't think it's unreasonable to think if you can find a Sunday guy that we could be talking in a month and a half about Nebraska hosting a regional. I don't no, think that's, that's crazy. No, that's their goal, and they are mashing the ball well enough to to do it. They just need the arms to 
to to catch up to to the offense. And yeah, if, if Walsh can can stay hot and and be what he's shown, that's awesome because your one two is fantastic. Well, and in terms of power numbers too with this team, I think every single pitcher has a guaranteed. I don't want to say guaranteed because you can't guarantee things in baseball, but it feels like more nights than not, you're going to get one to two home runs and you're going to have at least three to four runs of support. Can Nebraska find a guy that can consistently keep an ERA over the course of seven innings below a four? Mm -hmm. If you can find a guy like that and throw it in the Sunday lineup, I I think you got a great chance of throughout the Big Ten going and sweeping a couple weekends just with how good that offense can be. Well, you you need to sweep a lot in the Big Ten, first of all. Second of all, the starting arms, how long and will how how long will they go and can they go? So you're not saying <laughs> who, as we speak right now, bullpen wise, that's been the uh, the Achilles. That's well, been a problem, and, and that's how you make deeper runs into the postseason is through a deeper bullpen because you know how many games you're going to be playing with guys on limited rest. You need a deeper bullpen if you want to make a College World Series run. I don't think this team is even close to a College World Series team, and I'd love to be wrong on that, but I don't think it's there right now. But I think you have the offense to go host a regional and maybe get yourself a chance at a super regional where then things would get a lot more difficult. That'd be great. Quarterback discussion. So let's talk about what what Nebraska has right now. You've got the battle here. You've got Sims, the standout with 23 games under his belt dual threat really talented nfl guy is what rule says or at least a body type pretty plenty of room and that uh, that arm talent harburg and uh, of course richard torres you've got smothers you've got casey thompson on the sideline and i loved our discussion with just the, the the run game element from the quarterback in this pro style great comp from you on Philly, on Buffalo, on Baltimore, uh, just enough to be dangerous, right, with that quarterback run game and, element. And Baltimore might be the exception to the rule, and maybe not for much longer with Lamar build- Jackson's situation, but that's kind of one of the questions around Lamar is what is his longevity like, and you don't get those topics of conversation with guys like Josh Allen and Jalen Hurts because their offense is limiting them. Usually it feels like about five designed quarterback runs a game, and then you know what? If it comes down to the fourth quarter and you need it, you might get that number up to seven or eight, but it feels like they come into a game with, all right, we're going to get the quarterback about five designed run games, uh, run plays per game, and we'll go from there. They've stayed much healthier as yes. well compared to, to Lamar, and it just takes one time. But when we talk about the quarterback emerging – We know that Nebraska's offense wants to do the following. They want a strong run game. They want to use tight ends. They want ball control. They want to be physically dominant in the fourth quarter. And they have all this speed for a reason, either in the backfield or at wideout to to get big plays. You can't coach and catch speed all the time. But what are you asking from that quarterback? What do you need if you're Nebraska at offense for quarterback and and rules one double digit ball games with guys that are better than serviceable but they're they're not all conference they're not all conference and that's impressive cuz you're you're not building the offense around the quarterback and you, you need all the help you need to be diverse offensively you need that combination uh, of a uh, signal caller that can move around in the pocket, can make some passes. And if they've got the O-line and the running game to do it, lean on that and then just manage and then make a play or two. The, the, the teams that have won and won big in college football, they've had a monster difference maker at quarterback. Mariota with Oregon. You look at some of the dudes with Ohio State. You look at Burrow. But, but even with Burrow, Burrow was incredible, and he's so smart and talented, but he had the ultimate crew around him. Good running game with Clyde, the, the wideouts that are killing it in the NFL. They were special because of what was around him. And, and it really just depends on what you have at, at running back and wideout. That you, what do you prefer to, to, to lean on? What's your go-to? Is it going to be your run game because you got – some damn fine running backs that, that can get it done for you one through four, and then you just play action and you make the throw. Is your quarterback your best asset? So, yeah, we're going to build an offense around him and let him lead the way. Uh, Trevor Lawrence and, and Joe Burrow are two guys that are exceptional, but they had the guys and the skill players and a really good line 
there. So if I'm Nebraska and I'm looking at year one, I need a guy that is going to take care of the football. That's been emphasized by Satterfield, by Rule. And you have both quarterbacks that have been, I don't want to say problematic, but they've not been perfect or on the low end of turnover numbers. Uh, that's going to happen when you're throwing as many passes as Casey did at Texas and was asked to at Nebraska. You're going to have some interceptions. It's the fumbles that kill you. Well, at least it has with Nebraska and their turnover numbers with their quarterback. So I, I look at Sims, and from an advantage standpoint, it's not that Casey can't do it, but Sims has done it well. What's the availability? What's the durability? Both these quarterbacks also, uh, when we're talking one-two projection-wise in this race, they've had a history of injury uh, through no fault of their own. They've just gotten dinged up because they put their body on the line or they've not been protected. Well, so well, well, I asked the quarterback – to just make some simple throws, hit about 65%, be dangerous with your feet, make some big-time throws when called upon, but you don't have to carry the team. Well, And what I don't want from this quarterback race is I don't want the, the coaching staff to pick the guy that they think fits their offense better. I want them to pick the guy that you trust more with the ball in their hands, let's say, Four to five minutes on the clock in the fourth quarter, you're down by three and you're starting with the ball on your own 20. Which guy do you trust more to have the ball in his hands? And then you build your offense to suit that guy the best. I don't think, especially in year one, you should be coming in here and saying, well, we're going to sit the, the guy we trust more on the bench because the number two guy fits our offense better. I hope that that's not Matt Rule and, and company's plan. I don't think I don't from think what I've is. heard from them that it is what their plan. So the question becomes, which guy do you trust more in crunch time? Five minutes on the clock. That, that's what I'll say. You're down by three. You have the ball in the 20. You need to go 80 yards. Who do you trust more? Whichever that answer is, you build that offense to best suit that guy. And then you know what? If he goes down with an injury, you have that backup plan with the other guy where you can change up your offense just a little bit. But that's what I want in this quarterback battle is the guy that you're just going to trust more with the ball in their hands in crunch time. And we haven't seen much from Jeff Sims right now. I think Casey Thompson showed us last Casey's year. He can done that be that in, guy. Casey's done that in his career. He, he can be that guy. But if you think that you, you trust Jeff Sims running a, a quarterback run type offense in the fourth quarter, I guess that's the, the, the coach's decision. That's why I'm not coaching. But I just hope that that's what the, the criteria is for this, this quarterback race as it heats up. You know, it, it's, it's really up to the other 10, too. Hmm. What, what can the other 10 give you to help supplement so you are not a one-trick pony? That'll be something to look forward to this spring and, and beyond is just where the balance is in the offense can you rely on the run game? Can you get the wide outs and tight ends and not ask the quarterback to do everything? And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back to you, it's Hale Varsity Radio, presented by Currency. Time for a Jock Doc Wednesday, Nebraska Orthopedic Center. Dr. Brandon Seifert with us. Dr. Brandon, what's the good word? How you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. You're still suffering from uh, some bracket busting, but I'm hanging in there. How about yourself? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's been uh, it's been a long time since there was any <laughs> any rooting interest. <laughs> we'll uh, we'll just move on casually from from that. And uh, NBA playoffs around the corner, and the Brooklyn Nets shutting down Ben Simmons the rest of the season insert joke there but uh, in all seriousness with Simmons this is pretty serious Uh, the doctors and different specialists have consulted with the Nets and uh, he's entering into a rehab program on some full recovery and sounds like there's some nerve issues in his back Dr. Brandon Uh, touch on uh, some some potential reasons for this and and i know i can only imagine the wear and tear on uh, an nba player's back be it a big man or a point guard but just the amount of uh, physicality even in today's nba that's a reality yeah absolutely chris so you think about him and all of us at that level start to get pretty nervous about you once you start to have somebody's you know lumbar spine maybe some disc issues nerve issues um, in terms of once you start venturing into the surgical realm, and I think a lot of us obviously remember the stuff that you know, Tiger went through in the golfing world with his back issues. Um, you also got you know Peyton Manning had something a little further up, more cervical spine issues. So uh, they can be pretty problematic. Uh, they're not being super forthcoming in terms of you know what exactly what his surgery was initially, whether it was a disc issue. 
Um, but that would be my assumption. Um, so now you're in a scenario here where he's, this gentleman's had you know, previous surgery on his back, really has kind of struggled to get back to playing fairly well following that. And now you're transitioning into a period here where he's going to have some rest and some rehab and take off the rest of the season, you know, for some nerve issues in his back. So the question there always is, one, is this maybe a new injury he sustained on his back that's you know, maybe causing another nerve issue elsewhere? Two, is this maybe a scar tissue issue related to the surgery itself? Um, or three, is it just kind of that ongoing kind of maybe – maybe some permanent damage that happened to that nerve during his original injury that was even kind of pre-surgery. And so it's hard to kind of tease out what exactly, you know, it is in those scenarios. Um, but these can be very problematic. Take a guy like him who's, you know, super athletic, 6'10", jumping, moving around, banging bodies in the NBA, and that obviously can really do a significant amount of damage and trauma to, you know, your lumbar spine and the nerves in that area. Give me a rating on just – back issues with it being dicey i mean is that part of the body more problematic more lingering than than other areas other regions that you guys mess with Mm -hmm. you know it sure can be um and, and you know whenever we're talking on the sports medicine side we're always looking at what types of you know injuries and subsequent surgeries or treatments for those injuries? You know, how do those do long term? You know what our big term we always use in sports medicine is you know what's the what's the return to play level? You, know, you return at the same level you're at before, or what's your return percentage? You know to a level at before or even higher. And so as you start to look at those, you know we have some really good you know, track records in you know, certain types of injuries and. You. And then there's others that maybe not are, are not quite as successful at returning back to that level. Um, and some of that's just that there's not that many of those surgeries. Let's say, for let's say for example, in the lumbar spine, maybe in a nerve decompression scenario, which that might be what we're dealing with here. Um, you know, there's not that many of those being done on you know, high-level athletes, and so there's not a huge pool of. of sample size that you can use to say, hey, we have, you know, 90% of these athletes get back to the same level or above. But I would venture to say in the spine world, it's it's, it's lower um, in terms of that return to play. And I think that's because there's there's some chronicity that happens there in terms of the, the pain that continues. Some of those symptoms can, you know, recur. Um, those might be really successful surgeries in somebody who's not, you know, say an NBA player or a professional athlete. But when you start putting on that kind of abuse and wear and tear at that level, then the success of that or outcome of that surgery is probably less in that population just because of the abuse that they basically put their body through. Now, uh, Coach Vaughn of the Nets, Dr. Brandon, said that Ben Simmons has been feeling the pressure around these injuries, saying like he knows how much his cap it is and he knows what he's supposed to be doing for the team. And this is as hard as as it is on anybody as it is on Ben Simmons right now. And I want to get your take. Can a psyche be a part of this return to injury where if you go out there feeling the pressure of, of wanting to be back and wanting to perform that you might lead yourself to more injuries down the road because of the way you're trying to rush yourself back? Yeah, like that's a great that's a great point. You know, and that that probably has played a role here. Um, you know, it really does take a long time to recover from a lot of these injuries, especially some when you're dealing with kind of you know, the lumbar spine and nerve related issues. Um, just trying to reestablish that what we call posture restoration, reestablish those appropriate biomechanics, you know, for your back and your lumbar spine to get back to playing. That's really a hard that's hard to do, and it's hard to do that quickly. Uh, because most of these athletes have been basically compensating for this for so long that they start to develop, you know, you know, change in their biomechanics, probably poorer mechanics. And so to try to go back and to rebuild yourself into, you know, that strong core, appropriate kind of balance in all your musculature, it takes a long time to get there. And so you take a guy like him to your point of I, I, rushing trying to get back, and that can definitely lead to other issues where you start to over, you know, the overload syndrome, overloading other parts, you're kind of compensating and overloading other areas in your spine, then you start to feel nerve issues maybe at a level above or below where they were working. At what point does this long laundry list of injuries start to concern you long term for a career, Dr. Brandon? I mean, Ben Simmons only 26 years old, and uh, now it feels like mm-hmm. he's only played in a handful of games over the past couple seasons. At what point do you worry that his career longevity as a whole could be impacted by this series of injuries? Yeah, that's that's always an interesting thing to think about. You know, as you talk to you know, these professional athletes, you know, their agents, agents that represent the teams. And it's interesting to kind of sit in a room with those folks and see how they view different injuries. You know, there's some injuries we've talked about before where they'll look at and not even bad and I like no problem. We're going to draft this person because they're going to do well after this. This is yeah, that's a good outcome. 
And there's other injuries on that list where they don't really want to touch them. They don't want to draft them. They're worried about them. They'll move them down the draft board. You know, they may pick them up after the draft is free agent. Um, and so this is one of those that I start to get a little nervous about when you start to have these kind of chronic lumbar spine nerve related issues. Again, we're speculating here, so we got to be a little bit careful as we don't know, you know, truly what the structural damage is for him. Uh, but I would definitely be a little bit hesitant there. And then obviously you start talking about the other knee issue too. That's always such a hard, hard debate. Um, again, just sitting here not having all the data in front of me, yes, I would be concerned about that. Obviously, if we had some more maybe concrete data with some further imaging MRIs, uh, we might change our mind on that. Uh, but that is definitely a debate I'm sure the front office is having seriously about him right now. Dr. Brandon, real quick, you know, what, what could be an issue moving forward if he's cleared, he gets back, he's healthy? What's he going to have to really uh, hunker down on uh, from, a, from a game standpoint, what he brings to the table? It's always been assists and getting to the rim. Yeah. You know, as I look at kind of lumbar spine pathology where patients have pain, what's kind of that worst thing to do? A lot of it is when they're baking, when you're kind of reaching up and you kind of arch towards the back, so you're kind of hyperextending that back. So that rebounding motion, going up to dunk, going up to contest the shot, that's the part that will probably bother him the most. And then you think about kind of that downward part where you're jumping and landing and you're kind of having an axial load on that back and that kind of axial load through that lumbar spine is going to really irritate that area as well. Dr. Brandon, we'll get caught up again soon. Thanks for a few minutes today. Thanks, fellas. You guys take care. And now. And now back to Hale Varsity Radio. One final time, Wednesday edition, Hale Varsity Radio, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. Get the podcast, the segments you want, or the whole bleeping thing, the whole show. Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, or just watch Hale Varsity YouTube channel and uh, check us out daily on the Hale Varsity Radio Twitter feed at HVarsity Radio. Chris Schmidt. Elijah Herbal, give us a follow at Schmidt underscore radio at Herbal Essence for Elijah Herbal. Trev uh, checks in with the uh, network tonight that follows us up in Omaha. So check that in and see what he has to say. I got uh, lost watching a Husker football game this afternoon. It showed up on Facebook. It was the 91 Nebraska Colorado game. It was edited beautifully where. It didn't take too long. It was the infamous 1919 tie Mm. where the uh, buff faithful, the stand-up students, were chucking snowballs while the game-winning field goal was being attempted by Byron Bennett. There was an egregious multi-infraction clip fest that resulted in a two-point play return by Greg Beekert that screwed things up nebraska wins that thing 19 to 17 without the two-pointer sounds like no hard feelings on your part with some of the now i remember where i was game. watching it <laughs> over at some friends I mean, and what's cool and like if you bring this up to dolman there's some ptsd with dolman in this game because i think he was on the sidelines for it it was eight below as the game concluded or something like that. With wind chill, I assume? Yeah, it was a night game in Boulder in November. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it was the old AstroTurf at Folsom Field, so it was nothing but concrete. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Good ball game, though. The old 5-2. We'll have to bring that up to Chuck, see what he thinks of that game. And I think we had a comment on the stream yard about that one a couple days ago, so that would be good good to bring up with him. Ask, uh, Ask Mondays with Charlie. Only five days away now. What Colorado game do you hate the most? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's inter- We talked about this a couple days ago, but it is interesting to me how really, and I'm sure I'm going to have people in the, the stream that are mad about this. For my generation, I feel like the Iowa rivalry has at least matched that Colorado rivalry, at least in terms of our minds, because the last one we remember, Nebraska, Colorado, was that, that 2008 and Dominic and Sue won, and I know they've also played in 2009, but mm. uh, if I remember correctly, Nebraska... That was the Tiger Woods crash. That's what I remember from that game. Uh, see, and if I remember correctly, Nebraska kind of beat the brakes off Colorado in 2009. Is that right? Oh, it was two-touchdown win, but Colorado, it was like an 18-point ball game, and then I think Colorado got the dirty cover. Yeah, so, like, the, the, the one that my generation remembers is the, the Sue interception followed by the Alex Henry kick. That's, like, the defining Colorado game mm-hmm. in our memory, and we, we never quite saw 
the 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 glory of Colorado actually being able to to contest Nebraska on the football field with the exception of that 2005 Bill Callahan game. Uh, so that's why that I think was, that was that was an incredible game to be at too, where they eject the entire student section. I was at that game with my dad and my brother in 05 where there's empty water bottles or whatever was put in said water bottles being launched at the end of the third quarter. Corey Ross and company, Zach Taylor, they just carved up the buffs. We don't bring that up to Barney. Barney's golfing tomorrow. So we'll have to we'll have to to talk with Barney next week. We should just do a Colorado Nebraska game profile leading up to our trip to Boulder. Oh, we'll go through every single Nebraska Colorado game Not that every. Barney coached. A, a well, weekly segment. Well, he he'll want to spend plenty of time on O one. Yeah. Uh huh. Take a shot. He said, Chris Brown. Talk to you at four tomorrow. Thanks.